on the River Seine, Regal Paris, Rebellious Paris, Montmartre Paris, Imperial Paris, Paris Museums, Paris Music, Paris Songs, Paris Extravagances, Pigali Paris, Paris by Night, Paris France. So many shining faces in just one of the many cities of the world, in its avenues and its palaces, in its streets and its cafes, in its theatres and cabarets. We set off to meet the poets, the painters and the sculptors, the architects and the great men who have given shape to Paris. It all started here, 200 BC. The Gallic fishermen, the Parises, settled on this island in the middle of the Seine. It was the birth of Lutes, a name of Celtic origin, meaning dwelling in the middle of the waters. The barbarian invasions forced the Parises to retreat to the island to build defenses. 52 BC, the Roman troops occupy the city the town is developing rapidly due to its inland water transport. In the 4th century, Lutes took the name of its first inhabitants, Paris. Clovis made Paris his capital. He settled on the island which has been called La Cité ever since. L'île de la Cité is today the heart of Paris. Proud, elegant and majestical, we have Notre Dame of Paris. Founded by Bishop Maurice de Sully in 1163, the cathedral is built on the site of the old Gallo-Roman temple. It took 200 years to complete the construction of the most beautiful religious building in Paris. Notre Dame became the theatre for the great historical moments. St. Louis laid down the crown of thorns here. Philippe le Bel conducted the first general states of the Kingdom of France here. The process of reinstatement of Joan of Arc took place in the cathedral. In 1572, Huguenot Henry de Navarre waited for Marguerite de Valois alone in the choir, receiving their marriage sacrament. Later, Henry IV said, Paris is well worth a mass to attend the thanksgiving service for the surrender of the capital. During the revolution, Notre Dame became a fodder and supplies reserve. The bells were all melted down, except for the Great Bell. In 1804, Notre Dame once again became a place of culture, visited by Pope Pius VII for the coronation of Napoleon, first emperor of France.
In the square in front of the church, this is a point known as Kilometre Zero, symbolic starting point for all the main French roads. On the other side of L'Ile de la Cité, the seat of civil and judiciary authority since antiquity, former Supreme Court of Justice of the Kingdom, the Palais de Justice and the Conciergerie form part of the magnificent palace requested by Philippe le Bel in the 13th century. The courtyard inside Palais de Justice is Sainte Chapelle, consecrated in 1248, a prodigy of equality. For the first time, a chapel was made of a framework of pillars supporting the vaults. No flying buttresses, only fragile ones which were just sufficient. It took the architect Pierre de Montreuil only 33 months to erect Sainte Chapelle. The windows date from the 13th century and illustrate the Old and New Testament, covering almost 618 square metres. Saint-Chapelle, which was requested by Saint Louis, was built to house the crown of thorns of Christ, brought back by the Emperor of Constantinople in 1239. In his ancient palace, the caretaker was governor of the king's house. In the 14th century, the conciergerie became a prison Marie Antoinette and the family of Louis XVI were incarcerated in these dungeons, as well as Charlotte Corday, murderess of the revolutionary Marat, and Madame du Barry, Louis XV's mistress, the Girondins, victims of Dalton's treason, and Robespierre himself. From 1793 to 1794, the conciergerie became the antechamber of the guillotine for almost 2,600 prisoners of the French Revolution. Linked to L'Ile de la Cité by Pont Saint Louis, L'Ile Saint Louis was the property of the Notre Dame chapter before Louis XIII decided to develop it. Now a holiday resort, during the 17th and 18th century, the island was decorated with grand residences occupied by artistes and famous aristocrats. Théophile Gautier, Alexandre Dumas, Delacroix, Chopin, Georges Sand, and Baudelaire succumb to the charms of its caissides and gardens. All is but order and beauty, calm, velvet. The yellow Roman town of Lutes now stretches beyond the islands on the banks of the Seine. Petit Pont and Grand Pont run parallel to the Cardo, the main route of the city and major trunk road from Soissons to Orléans. The Cardo to the south is nowadays Boulevard Saint-Michel, which we follow to Montagne Sainte Geneviève. It's the year 451, Attila has just crossed the Rhine, the Parisians are panic-stricken. Geneviève, a young girl devoted to God, reassures them, certain of divine protection. Attila and the Huns turned towards Orléans, and Geneviève became the patron saint of Paris. Saint Geneviève district has for many centuries attracted students of theology, medicine, the liberal arts, and canon law. Numerous colleges have been built. In 1215, the first university came into being. Today, there are still many students on the Bullmit and in the Latin Quarter. In 1253, Robert de Sorbon, canon of Paris, 
founded a college. Today it's the Sorbonne, main center for higher education in France. Richelieu was a principal there. The actual building, constructed in 1624, or Richelieu's wishes, was made considerably bigger at the end of the 19th century. student quarter, where the biggest schools stand alongside innumerable bookshops, cafes and restaurants, is situated the church of Saint-Étienne du Mont, built in the 15th century. Consecrated in 1626, it is here that you come to venerate Saint Geneviève. In 1744, Louis XV, then seriously ill, vowed to rebuild the Saint Geneviève Abbey Church which was in ruins. Designed by Soufflot, saint Geneviève Church was finished in 1789. The Constituent Assembly made it the Pantheon, the last palace of residence of the great men of French liberty. The Pantheon houses the ashes of Mirabeau, Voltaire, Rousseau, Maréchal Lannes, and the dignitaries of the Napoleon Empire, Victor Hugo, Zola, Jean Moulin, and Jean Jaurès, and other such great men who served France. Taking Boulevard Saint-Germain, our steps lead us to the church of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Ancient and powerful Benedictine Abbey since the 8th century, the church was consecrated in 1163 by Pope Alexander III in person. Rue Bonaparte brings us to the Fine Arts School, former convent, destroyed during the Revolution. It served as a store for works of art up until 1816. This dome signals the Institute of France. The construction was financed with the fortune of Cardinal Mazarin. The former college housed the Institute in 1805. The French Institute includes the French Academy, the inscriptions of great literature, the sciences, fine art, the ethical and political sciences. On Quai Anatole France, we find ourselves at the Musée d'Orsay, on the 14th of July 1900, the Orleans Railway Company opened Gare d'Orsay, start of the line for the whole of the southwest. The electrification of the main lines meant that very long trains could be put into circulation. The platforms of the Gare d'Orsay became too short, and at the start of the Second World War, the station was closed down. But the area rapidly became a great centre of activity. The set for films, the Renault Barreau Theatre, a sales room. On the 19th of May 1958, General de Gaulle accepted it as the place to assume the power of the Republic. On the 1st of December 1986, the President of the Republic opened the Musée d'Orsay, much like the one you can go and see today. The museum exhibits the biggest collection of paintings and sculptures of the 19th century, thus adding to the Louvre and the Museum of Modern Art. Just next to the Musée d'Orsay and these animal sculptures, originally intended for the Palace of the Trocadero for the occasion of the Universal Expedition of 1900, here we have the Palace of the Legion of Honor. Built in 1786 by the architect Pierre Rousseau for Prince Frédéric de Salm, the palace was dedicated to the great Chancellor of the Legion of Honor by Napoleon in 1804. The Museum of the Legion of Honor is exceptional.
Paris is the city of palaces. Continuing our path along the left bank, the Quai d'Orsay brings us to Palais Bourbon. Personal residence of Louise Françoise de Bourbon, daughter of Louis XIV and Madame de Montespan, the palace was designed by the Italian Giardini, approved by Hardouin Mansart, an architect from Versailles, built and completed by Gabriel in 1728. Several architects and occupants regularly transformed the palace. The Hotel de Lassé was linked to the palace in 1768 by the buildings surrounding a courtyard of honour. During the Revolution, Palais Bourbon became national property. On the 21st of January 1798, the Council of the 500 installed itself here, and since then, for the Republic, the Empire, the Restoration, and until present day, Palais Bourbon has been the seat of democracy. The deputies of the National Assembly, elected by universal suffrage, represent the French people and vote in the laws of the Republic. L'Hôtel de Lassé is the residence of the President of the National Assembly, former residence of the Marquis de Lassé, and then of Prince de Condé up until 1827. Napoleon had the outside of the Assembly rebuilt in the style of the Greek temples. It was completed in 1810. In harmony with the Paris style of the Madeleine, the outside of the National Assembly displays an allegorical front wall. The statues of Colbert, Agueso, Michel de l'Hôpital and Sully face onto the Pont de la Concorde, built with stones from the Bastille. Place de la Concorde was moved between 1755 and 1775 by Gabriel. This work was demanded by the aldermans of Paris in honour of Louis XV. In 1792, the square took the name of Place de la Révolution. On the 21st of January 1793, the guillotine was set up for the execution of Louis XVI and it stayed there until 1795. 1,343 victims followed the death of the king, including the Girondins, Danton and Robespierre, trapped by their own justice. The obelisk was a present from the Viceroy of Egypt and came from the Temple of Luxor. It measures 23 metres tall and weighs 220 tonnes. Place de la Concorde is the centre of what is known as La Voie Triomphale. From the middle, the view looks out towards Les Tuileries and the Louvre, the Champs Elysees and the Arc de Triomphe and the Madeleine or the National Assembly. The eight statues which decorate the square are dedicated to France's biggest cities. To flank the Royal Road, the architect Gabriel had two hotels built, starting in 1755. Hotel de la Marine, originally the Royal Guard, today houses the major state of the National Marine. The Hotel Crillon, has become a place which is internationally renowned. The fiery Chevaux de Marly opens onto the most beautiful avenue in the world, the Champs Elysees. It's the year 1616. The avenue is nothing but fields and marshlands. Marie de Medicis decides to make it into a beautiful promenade. The Queen's Walk, bordered with trees, ran alongside the Seine and became a fashionable place. In 1667, His Majesty moved the Great Pathway. In 1709, the promenade was given the name of the Champs-Élysées. In 1814, Emperor Napoleon I was obliged to abdicate. The Allies of the Coalition entered Paris, and the famous Cossack Cavaliers camped on the Champs. They even cut down the trees for firewood. It took many years to restore the avenue to its pre-war splendor.
Surmounted by glass and iron domes, Petit and Grand Palais, constructed for the Universal Exhibition of 1900, were witnesses to the capital's entrance into the 20th century. Petit Palais has become the Musée des Beaux-Arts of the city of Paris, whilst Grand Palais houses temporary exhibitions and Palais de la Découverte. At the Avenue of the Roundabout of the Champs-Élysées, you must wander into Avenue Montaigne, Dior, Nina Ricci, Chanel. It's here that the prestigious houses of haute couture carry the renown of Paris throughout the world. Today, the Avenue of the Champs-Élysées is famous throughout the entire world. Some of the most important companies line the avenue under the admiring looks of the millions of visitors who crowd there day and night. You have to stop to watch this famous performance of Lido. More than 2,000 people visit the biggest spectacular of the capital every day. They come here to discover the atmosphere of the wildest Parisian nights. These, as they are fondly called, les filles, sing and dance every night in homage to love and beauty. By continuing up the Champs-Élysées to Place de l'Étoile, we stop for a moment at the Arc de Triomphe, requested by Napoleon in 1806, dedicated to the glory of his armies. The monument was unveiled by King Louis-Philippe in 1836. Set in the center of the square, its surface is decorated with low reliefs. La Marseillaise, or the departure of the volunteers, is the masterpiece of Rugue the Napoleon victories and the greatest hours of the French armies are retraced in its sculptures and high reliefs by Etex, Corteau and Pradier. Since 1920, the unknown soldier has lain under the monument and each night the flame is relit in memory of those who died in the Great War. An underground museum tells the history of the Arc de Triomphe. 45 meters wide and 50 meters high, Built by the architect Chalgrin, edifice creates a pause in the Champs Elysees. On the terrace, the view is impressive, looking out over the whole of Paris. From Place de l'Étoile, today called Place Charles de Gaulle, depart the 12 largest avenues of the capital. We've got immense lands to cultivate, roads to build, ports to open, rivers to be made navigable, canals to finish, the railroads to complete. That's what I understand by the empire, if we're to re-establish the empire. On the 7th of October 1852, Napoleon III had just launched the biggest building site in the history of France in order to move into the 20th century. Paris is the heart of France. Let's all work together to enrich in this great city and to improve the lot of its inhabitants. In 1853, Emperor Napoleon III confided the management of these great works to the chief of the Seine, Georges Eugène Haussmann. Avenues, squares, great boulevards, parks and gardens, the bridges and the ring railways, Les Halles, 
the opera and other such works made Paris a huge building site which lasted 17 years. In June 1859, the 11 communes situated around the centre of Paris were reattached to the capital to give it its present day appearance. Five hundred kilometers of sewers were dug out. Le Musée des Aigus retraces the story of this ambitious project. The bridges on the Seine were made bigger, new ones were constructed, the quay sides in the Seine became the most beautiful road in Paris. 1800 metres of river, which you can travel along in the Bateau Mouche, giving another perspective of Paris, its bridges and quay sides. On the case side, the parapets serve as sales counters for the booksellers. The old editions, second-hand ones, and the printed pictures give pleasure to the students and strollers lying in wait for a work which is rare or cannot usually be found. In front of the Hôtel de Ville, La Place de Grève gave its name to the meeting, the out-of-work labourers in the Middle Ages, from which comes the expression, Faire la Grève, to be on strike. On the 27th of July, 1792, the Commune released Robespierre, imprisoned in Luxembourg by the Convention, and gave him asylum at the Hôtel de Ville. Built during the 17th century from the drawings of the architect Bernabé, called Bouche d'Or, Mouth of Gold, because of his blonde moustache. The Hôtel de Ville experienced the anger of the people. On the 28th of May, 1871, the Commune of Paris installed itself at the Hôtel de Ville, and the Republic founded under the bayonet attacks from the people of Versailles. The Tuileries and the Hôtel de Ville disappeared in flames. In 1882, the building was reborn from its cinders in the Neo-Renaissance style, and is known today for becoming the residence of the Mayor of Paris. Tour Saint-Jacques is the old tower of Saint-Jacques-la-Boucherie Church. It is one of the starting points for the pilgrimages towards Saint-Jacques de Compostelle. Major monuments of cultural Parisian life, Théâtre du Châtelet and Théâtre de la Ville, have fortunately lost their purpose of the Middle Ages. The torture of victims used to take place in the noisy square of the meat market.
Boulevard du Palais crosses l'île de la Cité and invites us to continue our stroll along to Place Saint-Sulpice. In the centre, Fontaine des Points Cardinaux, erected by Visconti in 1854, gave its name to the statues of the bishops living in these recesses. However, none of the great men were ever cardinals. San Sulpice Church was built in the 16th century, but the building that you can see today was reshaped during the 18th century. Marie de Medicis no longer wanted to live at the Louvre, rather preferred a palace which reminded her of her former Tuscan home. Solomon de Brosse started the building of the Palais de Luxembourg. Becoming a prison during the terror of Luxembourg, it sheltered various parliamentary assemblies for the directive and the consulate. Today, the Senate sits in assembly at the Luxembourg. The president of the Senate is the second most important person of the state and replaces the president of the Republic in the case of a power vacuum. The Luxembourg gardens are open to the public Many poets stroll in these gardens where they found themselves dreaming of an encounter along its shaded walks. She passed by the young girl, lively and agile like a bird. She's maybe the only one in the world whose heart could answer to my own. Our bateau mouche arrives at Pont Tiena. Palais de Chaillot dominates the gardens opposite the Eiffel Tower. A more beautiful example of the architecture of the beginning of the 20th century, the palace and the gardens of Trocadero were moved for the exhibition of 1937. The gardens, with their water jets, offer a magnificent spectacle. Opposite Pont Diena, in perfect alignment, stands the Eiffel Tower. France will be the only nation in the world to have a flagpole 300 meters high. On the 31st of March 1889, the tower designed by Gustave Eiffel was unveiled. The iron structure weighs only 9,000 tons and the load on the ground is only 4 kilograms per square centimeter. Built in 1889 for the Universal Exhibition, the Eiffel Tower raised the indignation of many artists and writers who were still not used to this iron architecture. Guy de Maupassant could not accept the presence of this horrible skeleton. I eat on the first floor of the Eiffel Tower because it's the only place in Paris where you can't see the horrible thing. This symbol of the capital remained the tallest monument in the world for a long time. The tower proudly dominates the Champ de Mars. These former market gardens witnessed the Federation celebrations of July 1790, anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. Present gardens were moved in 1928. The view of the Champ de Mars ends at l'école militaire, the military school. In 1751, the investor, Paris de Verny, 
and the Marquise of Pompadour succeeded in persuading Louis XV to found a royal school for training small fortuned young nobles in the military career. From Gabriel's drawings in 1769, the school already admitted 500 students to receive training for three years. In 1784, the young officer, Bonaparte, was admitted to the school from which he left as artillery lieutenant. The most beautiful barracks in France from the 18th century still houses the schools of military training. On this great plain dedicated to military life, Louis XIV founded Hôtel des Invalides. Built in 1676, the building sheltered up to 4,000 wounded and destitute soldiers. In 1840, under the shimmering dome of Jules Ardouin Mansart, the ashes of Emperor Napoleon I were placed in a tomb built by Visconti. Transformed into a gigantic mausoleum, the tomb of Napoleon contains six sarcophagi. The first coffin is in oak, the second is made of ebony, the third and fourth are made of lead, the fifth of mahogany, and the last is a simple coffin made of iron. Saint Louis des Invalides Church is decorated with a multitude of flags taken from the enemy on the battlefield. Musée de l'Armée exhibits a unique collection of uniforms, weapons and models, retracing all the great moments of French history. The esplanade between the Dome des Invalides and Pont Alexandre III gives a feeling of space and harmony. Evidence of the big vogue for metallic constructions in 1900, Pont Alexandre III stretches across the Seine and leads us onto the right bank. We cross the Champs Elysees and pass along Rue de Faubourg Saint Honoré, famous for its shops selling luxury goods. We are now in Rue Royale. The former hotel of Richelieu has become the big restaurant Maxime's. To the north of Rue Royale is Place de la Madeleine. The Madeleine Church, the building of which started in 1790, was given, on Napoleon's wishes, a Greek temple-style facade in 1806. Here will rise a temple dedicated to the glory of the great army. Boulevard des Capucines, so called in memory of the Convent des Capucines, is the gathering place of the stars of songs and music hall. At number 28, the Olympia still resonates the songs of the 60s. Built by Garnier, the first opera house in France was opened in 1875. Garnier had dreamed of creating a Napoleon III style. It is the most beautiful monumental success of the Second Empire. Behind the opera Boulevard Haussmann is the essential place for shopping at Magasin du Printemps or Gallery Lafayette. Place Vendôme opens out into the majesty of the 17th century. Louis XIV put Superintendent Louvois to build palaces here to house the academies. Ardois Mansart, 
designed the palace, which was opened in 1699. In 1810, Napoleon erected Colonne d'Austerlitz here. 44 meters tall, the work of stone was covered in the melted bronze of the enemy's cannons to sculpt the military scenes of the famous battle. Knocked down by the Commune in 1871, the column was replaced under the Third Republic. The replica of the statue of Napoleon was also replaced. Place Vendôme today contains the boutiques of some of the biggest names in the jewel trade. The Palais Royal houses the Council of State. Anne of Austria and the young Louis XIV made this their home. In 1780, Louis-Philippe d'Orléans started the construction of the buildings which surround the square. He trusted the building to Victor Louis, architect of Bordeaux's Grand Théâtre and the Comédie Française. The area became a fashionable place to promenade. At the beginning of the 18th century, the museums, cafes and casinos in the gardens attracted a large clientele. It was here, so it's said, that the young Bonaparte had his first romantic adventure. In 1838, the closure of the casinos brought the decline of the galleries. The garden of the Palais Royal is today a place for a peaceful stroll where contemporary art and the majestic setting of the ancient palaces sit comfortably side by side. In front of Palais Royal, Rue de Rivoli runs alongside the Tuileries. Palais des Tuileries no longer exists, burnt down in 1871 by the Commune. Only the gardens remain, allowing us to admire the prestigious building passed down by the kings of France to Paris, the Louvre. In the place of the fortress of Philippe Auguste, in the 13th century, the Louvre was constructed bit by bit over almost 500 years. François I, Catherine de Médicis, Henry IV, Louis XIII, Louis XIV, Napoleon I and Napoleon III contributed to the magnificence of the palace that you can admire today. The Tuileries were completely burnt down, clearing a space on the Tuileries Gardens, clearing the view of the Arc de Triomphe, du Carrousel. Built in 1806 to celebrate Napoleon's victory, the Arc de Triomphe du Carrousel sits imposingly in the centre of the square. Napoleon's courtyard welcomes the technology of the 20th century with the pyramid of glass and steel. Built by the architect Léo Ming Pei on the request of François Mitterrand, President of the Republic, the Pyramid of the Louvre serves as the entrance to the biggest museum in the world. From antiquity to the end of the 18th century, it is a fantastical journey through the works of some of the greatest artists of the world.
after having regrettably left the enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa, surprising art is still to be found at Beaubourg at the George Pompidou Centre. The centre houses the most important museums of modern art. Built in 1977, it displays a steel avant-garde structure and brings together in its museum the most significant works of the 20th century. The old markets of Léal have become the Forum, ultra-modern heart of one of the oldest districts of Paris. In the 17th century, Quartier du Marais became a centre of elegance and celebration. Remarkable because of the coherence of its architecture, the hotels which are particular to France border the alleyways from the Middle Ages. Musicians, philosophers and artists of all disciplines were to be found around the Royal Square created by Henry IV. Place Royale was called Place des Vosges in 1800. The first consul, Bonaparte, called it this as thanks to the people of Vosges, who were the first to pay their taxes, which France needed so much. Hotel Carnavalet, Rue de Sévigny, is the former residence of Jacques de Linéris, president of the parliament in the 16th century. Musée Carnavalet superbly illustrates with its collection the history of Paris. Following Boulevard Magenta, we come to Montmartre. The mound of the Free Commune is dominated by the famous white dome of the Basilica of the Sacré-Cœur, which signals from far away the district of Paris that should not be missed. Place du Tête has maintained its appearance of a small village square. Tourist centre of Montmartre, the square is the privileged place for painters, always ready to sketch your portrait in charcoal or offer you the traditional paintings of the streets, bistros and restaurants. The cabarets still resonate with the voices of Jacques Prel, George Brassens or Léo Ferré who used to pass the hat around. The Basilica of the Sacré-Cœur was built between 1876 and 1914 and is dedicated to the Heart of Christ. The climb up to the dome after 273 steps offers an exceptional panorama over the city. The Campanile has one of the biggest towers in the world. Night time is approaching. Place Blanche lights up the long flanks of the Moulin Rouge. Founded in 1889, immortalized by the artist Toulouse Lautrec, the review in the Moulin Rouge perpetuates the tradition of crazy nights in Paris. Boulevard Clichy and Place Clichy come alive at night. The Temple des Ross burns the thousand lights of the cabarets and bars. In this district, solitude is out of place and meeting people is easy. Everything here is a celebration of beauty. 
everything is conceived purely for pleasure. Paris by night is the capital of pleasures. The crazy horse, Avenue George V, is the nudest of spectacles. The Folies Bergères are worth a visit during the day as much as by night. And after a wild night, the trip along Saint-Martin Canal offers much appreciated relaxation. Linking the Canal de Lourc to the Seine, Canal Saint-Martin stretches along four and a half kilometers. The old locks still let the boat trips go by. Getting about in Paris had always been the number one problem for the town planners. The Universal Exhibition of 1900 was the occasion to create an underground transport network. Engineer Fulgence Bienvenu opened the Metropolitan. With almost 200 kilometers of underground railway tracks, the network makes it possible to be just 500 meters from any district. The Nouille style metro entrances still decorate certain pavements. Boulevard Périphérique follows the line of the ancient fortifications, official boundaries of the capital in the 19th century. At Port Saint-Ouen, the flea market lets you rummage about and uncover the second-hand item which cannot usually be found, the unique and inexpensive item of clothing, or the piece of antique furniture that can only be found here. The shape of Paris of the year 2000 has already been designed, and even if each quarter has tried to keep the feeling of a small village, the Paris of tomorrow rises up around them. From the Tower of Montparnasse, passing through La Villette, the city of science, the district of La Défense proudly displays its arch along the perspective of the centuries.
Versailles, the enchanted palace where all is splendor and delight, with a marriage of art and nature, produce perfection. Versailles, its other face, a formidable instrument of power built by Louis XIV. The great Bourbon king moved the center of power away from Paris, as if to distance the court from the whispers and intrigues of the capital and the plots that have haunted him since childhood. Here, the king gathers all the nobility of his realm about him, under his watchful eye. Soon, more than 3,000 princes, courtiers, ministers, and servants live at Versailles. Palace, park, and garden are aligned with the sun's path. Here, all is discipline, order, balance. Beyond the monumental esplanade of the Place d'Armes, the first gate opens onto the forecourt. The minister's quarters throng with petitioners from all over the land who have come to Versailles to promote their own concerns. The second gate, destroyed during the revolution, is the real entrance to the palace. It is locked by night, but by day it is open to all. Everyone has access to the king. Understandably, this freedom astonishes foreigners. Guards stand by to confiscate firearms, to search carriages authorized inside the royal courtyard, and to make sure everyone is properly dressed. But everything has been anticipated. Those who have neither the means nor the right to carry a sword and hat can rent them at the entrance. People from all walks of life rub shoulders on the spectacular marble stairway that leads to the queen's quarters on one side and to the king's on the other. After the death of Queen Marie Therese, the king moves into apartments where he will live for the next 30 years. 30 years lived pitilessly exposed to the public eye. 24 bodyguards live in the guard room at all times. Four of them are assigned to protect the king from the crowd any time he moves about the palace. Here in the first anteroom, where courtiers stroll by day, the king eats the royal meal. At 10 o'clock, he displays his royal appetite to all. Before the fireplace, the royal caterers, literally attendants of the mouth, have laid the table for the sovereign and the royal family. Lords and ladies take their places in the anteroom according to rank, in the presence of curious passers-by, astounded by the spectacle. Through the windows of the second anteroom, one can see the Hall of Mirrors. Here, the courtiers and attendants wait to be admitted at the moment of the royal awakening. This room, called the Bullseye, takes its name from the curious shape of its circular window. Frolicking infants and cherubs. This frieze embodies the tastes of an aging king who demands that youth be ever present about him. A page boy silently opens the shutters of the royal bedchamber. Golden light suffuses the chamber. Slowly, the king awakens. The royal bed is protected by a gilded railing. Above the canopy, the personification of France watches over the sleeping king. Even more than the throne, the royal bed is the symbol of kingly power. The bedroom is at the center of the palace, the bed is at the center of the bedroom, and all who pass must bow before it. At 8.30, the head chamberlain murmurs, Sire, it's time to rise. The ritual unfolds, 
First, the ceremony of the small awakening, followed by the ceremony of the grand awakening. There is a constant stream of comings and goings. On an average morning, at least 100 people can be seen bustling in and out. Not only wardrobe and chamber attendants, but also bishops, ambassadors, provincial governors, and parliamentary officials who rise at dawn to be present at the Grand Awakening. One must be there to hear the news, to gossip, but more importantly, to be seen. Louis XIV has chosen the self-portrait of Van Dyck to hang above his door. High on the walls he has placed paintings by Valentin, the French pupil of Caravaggio. He likes Valentin's work, the tribute to Caesar, Saint John, Saint Matthew, Saint Mark. Once the ritual of the Grand Awakening is completed, the king meets with his counselors in the adjoining room, the official royal office. In the mid-18th century, Louis XV completely transformed this room, but nevertheless, it has always been the reigning heart of the realm, the symbol of the scepter and hand of justice. For more than a century, from 1682 until 1789, Versailles is the seat of absolute monarch and the government of France. The king rules alone. He demands consistency and obedience from his ministers. In this room, every day he summons his counselors, signs documents and receives petitions both grand and humble. It is the place where his subjects may address him directly. But sometimes, instead of his counselors, the king summons his superintendent of buildings and his architect, because the king's ruling passion is building. Versailles was originally a hunting lodge built by Louis XIII, but it would be unthinkable to keep such a primitive dwelling as the royal residence. It must be completely refurbished, terraces built, marshes drained, nature subdued. Construction will last more than 50 years. At its height, more than 15,000 men will be employed. At first, the young king merely embellishes the existing house of cards and visits it with female companions from time to time. In the forecourt, the architect Laveau constructs the common rooms, stables to the left, kitchens to the right. The gardens, following the layout of the gardener Le Nôtre, advance at a pace. When he is 30 years old, Louis XIV tells Colbert that he wants to move his council to Versailles. This prompts the first construction to enlarge the castle. On the side facing the town, Laveau's common rooms are linked up to the castle and their facades are soon adorned with columns, balconies, statues. The original castle is literally surrounded by new buildings. The first idea is to enclose it on the park side with two lateral wings, linked by a huge terrace. The influence of the Italian Baroque villa is dominant, but the uncertain French climate makes this terrace impractical. It soon disappears. The Hall of Mirrors takes its place. Though the terrace is gone, the architecture stays predominantly Baroque. The ground floor is designed like a huge pedestal in bas-relief. The first or noble floor is adorned with columns, statues resting on cornices, flat roofs disguised by a huge balustrade bristling with urns spouting flame, and trophies. In 1682, Louis XIV makes Versailles his official residence. In only 10 years, Jules Adouin Monsard, the king's new head architect, expands the building's surface fivefold. He adds two immense wings to the castle. The wing facing the park is designed for the comfort of the royal family. The wing facing the town for the discomfort of the courtiers. And of course, the middle is reserved for the royal apartments.
the king's apartments. This, the domain of the sun, the domain of a young king who wants to dazzle the world. Solar emblems intertwine with royal insignias in an explosion of gold. Cornucopias overflow with the bounty of the great century. A wealth of marble, a brilliance of color, grandeur, light, harmony. It has been said of Le Brun, the creator of this decoration, all the arts were his servants. Marble becomes a painting, sculptures too. Just as the sun is the symbol of the king, each room is dedicated to a planet. In the middle of this room, Venus, the goddess of love. On the arch above the door, the newlyweds Alexander and Roxanne are a reminder of the glory of the king's own wedding. The metaphoric message is clear to Louis XIV's subjects. Passing from room to room is a mythological journey. Diana's Salon. Diana is Apollo's sister and the goddess of the hunt. This bust of Louis XIV is a masterpiece by Bernini, the most renowned sculptor of the time. In 1665, Louis XIV agreed to pose for this finely crafted sculpture. He was 27 years old at the time. Lorenzo Benini had the opportunity to get to know the young monarch, whose taste he considered questionable. The Italian artist thought that the French king placed too much importance on fussy detail and paid too little attention on the grand picture, the Italian style. The royal apartment shows how the king's taste evolved. In Diana's salon, there is a billiard table. Louis XIV is an excellent billiards player. Three evenings a week in the winter, between six and ten, he demonstrates his prowess before an admiring court. Mars Salon. The largest room in the king's quarters is the ballroom. Here the king's retinue dance to the sound of violins and oboes. In the middle of the ceiling, Mars, the god of war, sits in a chariot drawn by wolves. This room is situated in the line of formal rooms. Every day, Courtiers and those curious to see the royal art collection stroll through it. A printed guide helps them to identify the paintings and sculptures. King David playing the harp, painted by Dominican, was Louis XIV's favorite canvas. The Pilgrims at Emmaus by the Venetian master Veronese, one of the most sought after artists of his time. Darius's family at Alexander's feet by the king's master painter, Charles Le Brun. The message is clear for those initiated. New French painting has achieved equality with the greatest of Italian art. The automatic clock in the Mercury Salon is all that remains of the furniture from the Louis XIV period. It was a gift of the clockmaker himself in 1706. Every hour, a small statue of the king appears, and an angel descends to crown him with a laurel wreath. Originally, this room was the royal chamber. It was dedicated to Apollo, god of the sun, the only heavenly body that rises and sets. Naturally, this is the room where Louis XIV's Apollonian awakenings and reposings were acted out. Charles de la Fosse's use of color is particularly well demonstrated here. In the corners, he paints the four continents bathed in the nourishing rays of the heavens. In the arching, Vespasian builds the Colosseum. Augustus has the port of Mycenae excavated. 
Thus, Louis XIV shows the world his talents as a builder. This portrait of the king in his coronation robes, painted by Rigaud, will hang in the palace throughout the 18th century as a permanent tribute to the greatness of Louis the Builder. The message implied by the decor changes and intensifies in the war gallery. The glories of battle are no longer disguised in mythological trappings. No longer do we see Apollo, but Louis XIV himself ravaging the enemy. At the height of his reign in 1678, the Treaty of Nimeguen seals his victory in the war with Holland. Nothing is untouched by this mood of exultation. Mirrors, rare marbles, superbly chiseled, and gilded bronzes. The War Gallery, the Hall of Mirrors, and finally, the Peace Gallery. More than 100 glittering yards immortalize the majesty of the King's apartments. Most of the time, the Great Hall of Mirrors is a kind of waiting room, but sometimes it is the stage for galas given for princely weddings, or perhaps receptions for ambassadors from distant lands who will return home to their sovereigns with tales of the grandeur of the King of France. Le Brun reserved the arched ceiling for works celebrating the greatest events of Louis XIV's reign. They revolve around a central composition, showing the great powers. In their presence, the young king turns away from light-hearted dalliance to contemplate the immortal crown. Seventeen mirrored arcades are an arrogant display at a time when mirrors are an item most can ill afford. The technical prowess of the kingdom's new factories is the envy of all Europe. Mirrors of glass inside, mirrors of water outside. Great ornamental pools lined with allegorical statues of the rivers of France, typify these gardens of high Baroque style. Versailles has the most magnificent royal garden in all of Europe. Its creator, André Le Nôtre, is not merely a gardener. He is a landscape architect, perhaps the first. He transforms nature organizes it, expands it. But Versailles is also a pleasure garden, which never ceases to amaze. Sculptures and dogs' mouths spouting water reflect the greatest pleasure of the court, the hunt. The king would sometimes give his own guided tours, setting the itinerary, where to stop to admire a particular view, when all the joy of discovery finally overwhelms the senses. The pater, exposed to sun and wind, are not really intended for strolls, but for enhancing the buildings. They can be admired from the apartments and cross to reach the orangerie. 1,080 exotic tropical trees. Orange trees from Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Lemon trees, oleanders, and pomegranates. Some of them over two centuries old. The Orangerie, with its purity of line, use of space, its 13 meter high arches, reaffirms the genius of Ardouin Monsard. Its southern exposure and double windows kept the orangerie at a constant temperature, five to eight degrees centigrade, even during the winter.
to the left, facing west. A dozen groves have been concealed in the woods that stretch to the north and south of this vast perspective. An outdoor ballroom in the bowl of an amphitheater. Delicate cascades and filigree rockwork adorned with shells. The court dances in this grove. The time is now past when the young Sun King would shine in the company of such mistresses as the gentle Lavalier or the exuberant Athenais, Marquise de Montespan. These enchanted gardens rang with the music of Lully, the poetry of Moliere, and forged the reputation of Versailles. The secondary alleys that run parallel to the vast perspective are dedicated to the seasons, with of course Apollo, sun god, reigning from the center. The play of light and shadow, one hour melting into the next, the year melting away. God of the grape harvest, Bacchus, bales the September waters and autumn rains. Further down the path cut through the woods, the god of winter, Saturn, contemplates clouds while cherubs, the promise of spring to come, flutter about him. These fountains are made of gilded and painted lead. The gardener has created a sense of intimacy with winding paths, secret spots hidden behind trellis work. The of the Colonnade is next to the Maronnier's room. Here in this space used exclusively for concerts, we see pure classic lines with sculpture, marble, water. The Rape of Persephone by Pluto by François Girardon, the king's favorite sculptor, thrusts upward from the center. This is the perfect marriage of the architecture of Jules Adouin Mansart and the gardens conceived by Le Nôtre. At the heart of the garden is the fountain of Apollo's chariot. The young god is drawn by four fiery horses as he rises from the dawn. He is escorted by four tritons and by four sea monsters, four of everything. The solar theme dominates in the whole garden, but it's particularly apparent in the central axis the four seasons, the four continents, the four natures of man. The light bearer creates an entire cosmology. Apollonian myth is rich with tales, his wars, his loves, his pastimes. Latona's fountain shows a scene from the gods' childhood. To flee the wrath of Jupiter's wife Juno, Latona, Diana and Apollo's mother, seek shelter in a foreign land where she is cruelly tormented by the local peasants. Desperate, she begs the father of her children, Lord of Olympus, for protection. Jupiter transforms the insolent farmers into toads and lizards. You cannot see the grove of Apollo's baths from Latona's fountain. Louis XVI would ask Hubert Robert to completely redesign the grotto of this remarkable sculptural trio, originally commissioned by Louis XIV. The 
the sun horses. Apollo waited on by his nymphs. This group illustrates the god bathing after his daily toils. François Girardon and Thomas Regnaudin carve these seven figures from the finest white marble. The huge Grand Canal. An entire flotilla sails here. Sloops, Venetian gondolas, yachts presented by the King of England, and royal galleys. And deep in the forests lie the hunting paths. As Versailles expands more and more, the king finds he needs a new country house, the Trianon. He can invite his family here. Both his heir, the Monseigneur, and his many mistresses' children visit him here often. Madame de Montenon, whom he had secretly married, joins them. She tells of how one summer in 1689, the perfume from the flowers was so overwhelming that the party had to flee the garden before all the ladies fainted. At the Trianon, all is organized to make the garden an extension of the house. There is only one floor. The court is seen from the garden. Inside, every angle can be contemplated through long bay windows. The gardens are visible everywhere. It is a palace of flowers. Leaving the Trianon, one can regain the palace by way of the north wing. Everything is a celebration to water. The sparkling fountains seem to shape the light around them. At the top of the Alley of the Infants, one can see the nymph's bath and the pyramid. Behind this fountain of crustaceans, dolphins and tritons, the chapel soars. It is fitting that the house of God stand higher than the house of the king. Angels bearing palms, cherubs, fleur de lis line the roof. The chapel is as luminous as heaven itself. It is the manifestation of the triumph of Christ the King. Like all Palladian chapels, it has a second floor. The pillars look like embroidery set in stone. Above them, angels carrying the symbols of Christ's passion mark the stations of the cross. This procession of pain leads to the altar just as the passion led to death before the resurrection. Death, the deposition. Christ after the crucifixion held in the arms of John and mourned by the Virgin Mary. This gilded bronze bas-relief is the masterwork of Van Cleve. But the great sacrifice is followed by the triumph of the resurrection. It is not Apollo's son, but God's son that illuminates the earth. Yave can be read in the triangle, the symbol of the Holy Trinity. Every day chords swell from the giant organ as the prayer for the monarch lifts heavenward. Domini salvum fac regem, God save our king.
The domed ceiling shows a sky torn asunder by the glory of a reborn Christ, master of the universe. The painting is by Lafosse. Reigning over all, God the Eternal Father by Antoine Coypel. And finally, the dove, the third element of the Trinity, by Jean Jouvenet. The Holy Spirit descends to the royal balcony with a very Christian king, the sacred king, lieutenant of God on earth, receives mass daily. On the floor below is the cipher of Saint Louis, forefather and patron saint of the monarchy. This chapel is the last construction of Louis XIV's reign. It was begun by Ardouin Mansart and completed by his brother-in-law, Robert de Cotte. It is a huge sculptural undertaking, the work of three generations of artists and workers laboring for a reign that would never end. The chapel is consecrated in 1710. Five years later, the Sun King breathes his last. Louis XIV's great-grandson, Louis XV, the beloved, painted by François Le Moine. Nothing seems to have changed. The young king, most beautiful man of the realm, is also depicted as a Roman emperor, but this time, he's holding out an olive branch. Louis XV continues his great-grandfather's building projects, especially Neptune's fountain. The new fountains are extravagantly rococo, and add a new flavor to the garden's aspect. But even at Versailles, change is coming. A libertine mood from Paris brings a sense of folly and intimacy. And Louis XV is a man of his time. Large spaces shrink, and here we find the king in his small apartment. The king lives in a private room now. This is where he sleeps, after enduring the rituals of awakening and reposing in the chilly formal halls of Louis XIV. In 1754, the great antechamber becomes the office of the clock in homage to this monument of science and art. This astronomical clock shows the phases of the moon, the days up to the last second of the year 9,999, the hour. And finally, in a crystal globe, it shows the planetary movements. The molding along the ceiling is delicate and fanciful. It is pure Rococo. Throughout Versailles, elegance is giving way to daring. The king's desk is perhaps the most famous in the world. Louis XV wanted to leave his papers in disarray unseen by prying eyes. The cabinet maker, Resnaire, invented for him the first roll-top desk. It took him 10 years, and he signed it Resnaire, 1769, which is almost unheard of. The skill of the inlay is astonishing, as is the bronze work and the elegance of line. The tiny statues, the attention to detail. The keyhole is shaped like a fleur de lis with a matching key showing the royal cipher. A quarter turn reveals the secret drawers.
One by one, Louis XV received his ministers in this small office. While next door, the spies of the king's secret service awaited orders to scour Europe in the sovereign's name. The metal cabinet by Gaudreau is all curve upon curve, a perfect example of Rococo predominance in the 1740s. Thirty years later, two other more sober corner cabinets were made to complement it. They held the newly minted medals of the history of the realm. As in all these perfectly detailed rooms, the carved marble of the fireplace is perfectly coordinated with that of the mantelpiece. In Adelaide's room, we find some of the best woodwork in the castle, made by Webeck. Here Louis XV's favorite daughter, the third of his seven girls, studies Italian with Goldoni and the harp with Beaumarchais. This is undoubtedly where the prodigy Mozart played harpsichord for the royal family in 1763. Combs, scissors, and sponge are reminders that this little room was the king's bathroom. The delicacy of these gilded designs, green gold, matte gold, glittering gold, show that private comforts and pleasures were integral to this king's reign. At the heart of the castle, the stag's court opens on what looks like a stack of little rooms, the king's suite. A graceful stairway opens onto a landing that leads to the most intimate rooms. Low ceilings, undecorated walls very different from the preceding reign. The king's domestic life is hidden even from his courtiers. Surrounded by ambition and intrigues, Louis XV turns in on himself and his private life. After the hunt, he summons a few select friends for a quiet supper, regaled by brilliant conversation and France's finest cuisine. The king is at ease here. He can be free to relax in the company of friends. The king submits less and less to the stiff ritual of the public meal, and no one is ever quite sure where he is. Perhaps he is bantering with Madame de Pompadour, the queen of this little world for 20 years. The king's last great passion would be for the young beauty Madame du Barry. Rumor has it that she is the daughter of a priest. The court is outraged when this young countess is installed with the king. 1770, the court discovers the opera house when the Dauphin, the future Louis XVI, weds Marie Antoinette. By using old plans from the Louis XIV period, the architect Gabriel conceived a long colonnade, made to look even longer by a play of mirrors. Thanks to its oval shape, every member of the audience had an unhindered view. The acoustics are perfect. Because it is made of wood, the house resonates like a rare violin. There are 1,000 seats. The orchestra pit seats 80 musicians who play Lully, Rameau, Gluck. The king has his own box. He wants to see without being seen. Today, this opera house is the largest surviving court opera in Europe. Louis XV dies in 1774. A heavy past sits on the shoulders of the two young heirs, ill-prepared to reign. Painter Hubert Robert shows the royal couple watching the felling of trees in the park. They have grown too old. Prophetic canvas. 
The statues, a symbol of a glorious past, keep watch. The present is soft and light, but an uncertain future is mirrored in these grim skies and the desolation of these dying trees. Indecisive and shy, Louis XVI is more interested in science, the hunt, and fine living than in governing. He likes to hide away in his comfortable rooms, especially his beloved library. Sculpted infants support the mantle of the fireplace. Across the front are gilded bas reliefs. The king is a curious man. He is passionately interested in the voyages of discovery. He traces on his globe the route of Captain Cook's journey and works on mounting the expedition of his own navigator, La Perouse. Madame Vigée Lebrun captures the natural dignity of the queen, Marie Antoinette, in this painting. Marie Antoinette detests Versailles and ridicules royal etiquette. Young and spirited, the French queen seeks diversion and pays no heed to the advice of wiser counselors. When she has to reside in the palace, she hides away with her favorites in her large apartment or her gilded salon. Reznaire, the cabinet maker, who constructed the famous roll-top desk, makes her an ensemble of furniture exquisitely decorated in bronze and fabulously expensive. Not much of a reader, Marie Antoinette almost never visits the library designed by Richard Meek. Instead, she spends much of her time resting in her boudoir, the sofa room. Louis XVI redecorates this room for her after the birth of their first son. The queen's favorite emblems are all there. The Habsburg Eagle, which is even incorporated into the glass in the door. The Rose for Love. The Peacock, the symbol of Juno, Queen of the Gods. epitome of dynastic glory. All the heirs to the throne are born here. Three queens have slept in this bed. The decoration is pure Marie Antoinette. Here she is in her room, surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting. The structure of the room goes back to Marie-Thérèse, Louis XIV's wife. The woodwork and the ceiling decorations were made for Louis XV's wife, Marie Legzinska. The queens had to observe the same rituals for their toilette, their meals and their sleep as their husbands. Even childbirth was a public affair. Marie Antoinette reacts violently to this practice. Her first lady-in-waiting describes how in the final moments of labor, Vermont, the obstetrician, shouts, the queen is delivering. The oglers thrust their way into the room. There were so many of them, and they were so loud, that I thought the queen would die of fear. Untouched since Louis XIV, the ceiling in the Salon of the Nobles is dedicated to Mercury. Here the queen holds audience. This antechamber is reserved for the great meal, which now only takes place on Sunday. Marie Antoinette just makes an appearance. She doesn't even take her gloves off. Why bother coming to Versailles, people wonder. 
We never see the king or the queen anymore. In response to the increasingly virulent attacks on her, Marie Antoinette commissions this portrait. She is depicted in Her Majesty, mother to the heiress to the throne, sovereign queen of France. But it is already too late. This picture is dated 1787, only two years before the revolution. In this climate of discord, the Trianon plays an ill-fated role. But let's back up a bit. At the encouragement of Madame de Pompadour, the Trianon had been expanded. The Marquise was the only person who could entertain and distract the difficult Louis XV. She managed to get him interested in the Trianon project, which she had worked on with the architect Gabriel. In the new pavilion with its French garden, Louis XV could keep his herbariums. There were concerts and dainty little meals. The frieze of roosters, chickens and turkeys mirrors the nearby menagerie, full of barnyard animals. Fifteen years after the French pavilion, Gabrielle built the little Trianon castle to modern taste, a Grecian design. Madame de Pompadour, who died in 1764, never lived to see it completed. There is a break here with the Rococo, a movement towards classicism that can be seen in this stairwell. Its simplicity is a stark contrast to the ornate banister festooned with Marie Antoinette's monogram, a reminder that as a gift, Louis XVI has given her the Trianon. The audience room is the largest of all the rooms in the Queen's quarters. Flowers abound, lilies and roses, sunflowers, even the flowers that figure in the myths of Narcissus or Hyacinth. The queen is alone here for long, too long holidays. The lady of the manor admits only members of the royal family and a few chosen friends in her presence. Protocol is, of course, dispensed with. open out onto lawns that have been lined with Louis XV's pride and joy. Long greenhouses designed by Jussieu. Marie Antoinette had them raised. Marie Antoinette's love of nature repeats itself in her extraordinary bedroom chairs. They were ordered from Jacob, the most daring carpenter of the day. cones, wheat stalks mingle with lily of the valley, precious fabrics are embroidered with wool. Nearby, the Temple of Love with its brooks and rustic air sits in the newly constructed English garden. This little cockeyed room was created especially for Marie Antoinette. The sliding mirrors seem to express the queen's desire to hide away from the world. Another escape, the theater. 
On this stage, Marie Antoinette acts out her favorite roles. She plays Rosine from Beaumarchais' Marriage of Figaro, which Louis XVI had banned in Paris. The house still has all its original machinery and all its rigging. Now all is silent, waiting for the curtain to rise again. This scenic decor from 1750 is among the oldest in the world. At the edge of the Trianon's domain, the architect Meek designs this make-believe shepherd's village for the queen. It has a dozen little rustic Norman houses, a farm, a dairy, a windmill, a pond, and of course, the queen's house. It's a pastoral refuge. On October 5th, Marie Antoinette is at the Trianon when news comes that the mob is marching towards Versailles. The next day, the queen's apartment is invaded and her bodyguards slaughtered. The king gives in to the rebels, forced departure for Paris. When the king and queen were guillotined in 1793 and 1794, at the height of the reign of terror, the palace is threatened with destruction. The people cry, let them plow it under. Potatoes are planted in the formal garden, the furniture auctioned off. In the course of the year, 17,000 lots fall under the auctioneer's hammer. The slow decline begins until the dawn comes again, for Versailles will outlive any revolution, and the fascination grows. In 1810, Emperor Napoleon I, riding here in front of the Trianon, is nourishing a desire to set up his court at Versailles, he has just married Marie-Louise, the great niece of Marie Antoinette. All the same, Versailles intimidates him. He prefers the Trianon and moves in. The emperor's furniture is still there, so much so that he feels more present than his predecessors. In his room, Louis XV's paneling disappears behind the bed, and the chairs are recovered in cream-colored silk embroidered with silver. But time and tide wait for no man. Five years later, with the defeat at Waterloo, the empire falls. Crowned king in 1830, Louis-Philippe does his best to save Versailles, but to what purpose? He decides to make Versailles the symbol of the nation. 1837, the palace becomes a museum, a shrine to the bygone glories of France. Louis-Philippe wants to unite the French people who have been torn apart by rival factions. He tries to appease the nobility by consecrating five rooms to the Crusades. The dominant symbol of the main room is a 16th century cedar door that originally stood in Rhodes at the hospice of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. It was a curious neo-Gothic touch in the Baroque and Rococo halls of Versailles. Louis-Philippe chose the most renowned painters for the canvases. Delacroix creates Entry of the Crusaders into Constantinople. The former annex of the princes on the first floor becomes a 120 meter long battle gallery. 35 canvases and 75 busts are a monumental summary of France's military history, at least its victories. Clovis, the founder of France, victorious at Tolbiac in 496. Saint-Louis fighting at Taibourg in 1242 by Delacroix. François I at Marignon in 1515 by Fragonard the Son. Louis XV and Marshal de Saxe at Fontenoy in 1745 by Horace Vernet. Napoleon at Austerlitz in 1805 by the Baron François Gérald. 
It is thanks to Louis Philippe that Napoleon's presence is so dominant at Versailles. There are many nostalgic tributes to the Napoleonic era. David's famous Coronation of Napoleon gives its name to this gallery, the Coronation Gallery. It has been redecorated in high empire style and houses another of David's canvases, Distribution of Eagles. The length of the suite of rooms on the ground floor of the South Wing also honors the Napoleonic era. Giraudet's revolt in Cairo dramatizes this event in the Egyptian campaign. Napoleon also appears high up on the top floor. Painted by Barango, Napoleon in Italy rushes forward under a barrage of bullets to take the bridge of Arcola. Twenty rooms illustrate the twenty years of Napoleonic influence over the destiny of France. Thus, Versailles is the major museum dedicated to Napoleon, a museum that records the history of France from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. The palace lives on today. In its 800 hectare estate, millions of tourists can visit 120 historical galleries and 120 rooms of the royal residence. The treasures dispersed by the revolution have come home. In Louis XVI's games room, the proper furniture has found its proper place. Marie Antoinette's dinner service awaits the Queen's supper. The vast dining room is ready for a formal banquet. Louis XV's decor has been reinstalled. The new carriage museum in the royal stables displays gala coaches. Royal carriages. And in the gardens, Enceladis Grove has been restored to its former splendor. Throughout the estate, the original hydraulic system functions, giving life to this fairyland. There are 200,000 trees to prune and care for, 210,000 flowers to be planted every year as well as more than 2,000 windows, 700 rooms, 67 staircases, 11,000 square meters of roof. Its splendor intact, Versailles, just as in the glorious days of the Sun King, still fascinates the world. <laughs>